तदेक स्मरामस्तेक भजाम तदेक जगत्साक्षिप नमाम सदेक निधान निरालंबमीशम भवाबोधिपोत शरण्यम व्रजाम ओ शाति 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 On that alone do we meditate that alone do we worship to that alone the witness of the universe do we bow to that one who is our soul eternal support the self existent lord the raft to safety across the ocean of this world do we come for refuge om peace 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 Good morning. Good Thank. Morning. You. Nice to see you. Do you want to put that? Or is it? Nice to see you. And uh, on this cool Sunday morning, and uh, our topic is about the fine art of forgetting. Mm. I've been thinking about uh, how precious memory is. For for most of us, we consider memory to be very precious. Our own memories, our sense of who we are, is so tied to that, to uh, to what, what we have done in our lives and and what we know. And uh, we remember that it was me who did that. That that time that I uh, graduated from high school and I gave the valedictory speech, or that time I. played a concert i played the, my first piano recital as a child or i uh, f- went camping for the first time with my school school boy scouts group or whatever it is and uh, that time i met when i met my future spouse the, the, all these kind of events they're they're treasured memories or the time i went to visit paris or delhi or baltimore with a friend these kind of memories for, we we treasure them and they they form part of the story of that we tell about who we are and and then also there's also spiritual memories that i might went on a pilgrimage to uh, varanasi or south pasadena maybe the time we received spiritual initiation the glimpses we've had of higher spiritual truth those also are memories that we treasure so why do we want to forget what what's what's the art of forgetting <laughs> uh th- of course we also have painful memories and oftentimes those are the ones that are hard to forget the time we got fired from a job maybe the death of a loved one uh we were insulted by a friend somebody told us a lie uh and then there's another category uh we, which we can call traumatic memories if we've we've witnessed a trauma or experienced a trauma ourselves perhaps a, a car crash or a, a uh, some violence uh, uh, inflicted on us or uh, perhaps we had some uh, abuse we were abused as a child these are very difficult memories to forget and then there are national traumas like the most obvious example coming to mind is the terrorist attacks of uh, September 11th which uh, we often people said about this we will never forget always remember this never forget these these uh, traumatic events then we have a semantic memory which is also precious semantic memory means uh, we can memorize scripture or memorize a poem or memorize a song and recite it from memory and that's precious to us and that's that's wonderful it's a wonderful gift um, some people are very good at remembering names and we always admire that <laughs> most of us are not that good <laughs> and then we have also of course implicit memories like skills uh, riding a bike swimming right you maybe i haven't ridden a bike in 10 years but if i get on a bike i'm sure i'll be able to do it because it's one of those things that i remember how to do not consciously but it's it's in there uh even walking we know how to walk we remember how to walk sometimes people after getting a stroke they forget how to walk and they have to relearn how to walk so all these memories these different kind of memories go to form our concept of ourselves of who i am as a person that's me 
and actually we all have our own kind of autobiography that we tell ourselves and um, this is who we think we are. And it's firmly based on memory, correct or incorrect. And many times <laughs> there may be a lot of incorrect memories mixed in with the, tr with the true memories. Uh, so forgetting is something we actually fear. Most of us fear uh, losing the, our precious memories because then we're losing the sense of who we are. We're losing a, some essential part of who we are. And we see the tragic cases of, of dementia and Alzheimer's disease where people gradually forget everything, sometimes even forget who they are. And uh, we are terrified of that. We can't remember someone's name and we think, oh my gosh, am I getting Alzheimer's? Am I losing my memory? When I was a kid, I would be assigned certain books in school and I would ask my mom, I would tell my mom about it and she'd say, oh yeah, I read that. And so I said, well, do you, what was it about? Do you remember? <laughs> she wouldn't remember. She would have read the book in her childhood and she wouldn't remember what it was. And that used to irritate me a lot. I go, what? You read it and you can't remember? Now I understand, of course. <laughs> Books read long ago. So uh, this is the, 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 the fear of, of forgetting. And then in spiritual life, we often em, em, uh, emphasize the importance of remembering also. One should always remember God. And we talk about that a lot. We should remember God. Sri Ramakrishna often asks us to remember death. Always remember death. Remind us it's coming, it's coming. So why this topic then, fine art of forgetting? Well, if we reflect a little, uh, partly because I like to find some kind of catchy topic, uh, but uh, if we reflect a little, we realize that forgetting also is essential to our lives, essential. Uh, it's like two sides of a coin, the, the remembering, holding on to memories, holding on to those things, and forgetting. And perhaps a, a, a good example of th that, that shows the importance is uh, the very unusual and remarkable case of, of a woman named Jill Price, who's one of just a handful of people in the world who have what is called hyperthymesia, from the Greek thymesis, remembering, and hyper, really intense. Uh, she wrote a book, The Woman Who Can't Forget, The Extraordinary Story of Living with the Most Remarkable Memory Known to Science. She has an extreme biographical memory, and she says from about the age of 14, she can remember everything in her life. And they've tested her. Just name a random date in her life after the age of 14. Before that, she can do many, but after 14, it's, it's perfect. Any date, like March 13, 1983, and she'll tell you, oh, well, that was, she'll tell you the day of the week, she'll tell you what the weather was like, she can tell you what she had for breakfast that day, she'll tell you what, uh, all the things she did that day, and she can't stop it, she can't forget it. And her whole, uh, when she's just sitting quietly, the reverie starts and the memories just come pouring in of all kind of trivial details of her life. Uh, and it's fascinating, no doubt, but for her, it's actually a torture. She still lives with her parents. She can't manage to live alone. Um, and she writes in her book, which she had someone helping her write the book, but she's the author. She writes, I realized just how profoundly our memories assist in constructing our sense of who we are and of the meaning of our lives. Whereas people generally create narratives of their lives that are fashioned by a process of selective remembering and an enormous amount of forgetting and continually recraft that narrative throughout the course of their life. I have not been able to do so. So she's, she has this insight that what we do is we craft and recraft this narrative of our life holding on to certain memories, letting others, uh, others fade, fade away. And uh, in her case, uh, she says that a memory generally contributes to the construction of our sense of self. But in my case, in so many ways, my memory is my sense of self. I don't so much have a story of myself as I have a remarkably detailed memory of myself. So, um, 
this really seems to me to be a great example of why forgetting is important. If we remembered everything, <laughs> we would be like, the, like, this, like this poor woman, poor and yet most unusual woman. It does give us a, a hint at the tremendous capacities of, of our brains and our minds. Just think, she could remember all those details, so it's possible for a mind to remember those things and not get filled up. It doesn't seem like her brain has gotten filled up and nothing more will go in. It's still uh, absorbing more and more information and it's, it's, it's having no difficulty. So uh, after coming up with my sermon, uh, my, my, my topic, I Googled it and found a sermon with a similar topic, forgetting as a fine art. Uh, published in 1909 by one William George Jordan. And it's, uh, he makes a nice point. I'd like to read his, uh, one of the opening paragraphs of his uh, sermon. It's quite uh, enjoyable. He, 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 quite insightful. He, first of all, he uses editor's language. In the old days, you would use a blue pencil to mark a manuscript for, the editor would use a blue pencil to knock out what should be removed. And, and he's, he says, a forgetting is one of the fine arts of living at our best. The blue pencil of wisdom, cutting out unnecessary words from the text of our living. So uh, he suggests that all the virtues, vices, and qualities of mental and moral life may be defined in terms of forgetting or remembering. Selfishness, he suggests, is forgetting others in over-remembering ourselves. Worry is the inability to forget the troubles that may never happen. Honor is remembered high standards made evident in acts. Anger is the explosion of an overheated memory. It's very insightful, really. <laughs> Forgiveness is the heart's forgetfulness of an injury. Ingratitude is, the, is um, the heart's forgetfulness of a favor. How, how, uh, f so forgiveness is the f heart's forgetfulness of an injury and ingratitude, heart's forgetfulness of a favor. Uh, envy is forgetting one's own possessions and over-remembering those of others. Patience is forgetting petty troubles along the way in concentrating thought on the goal. So uh, we, we, I, I think he makes some wonderful points about the importance of remembering. What we think of, what we remember, and what we forget plays a big part in our lives. And it's, uh, there's an art to knowing what to forget and what to remember. I, can't, I chose this topic because I think many of us, and someone I've in particular had in mind who has a lot of trouble forgetting certain things that, that trouble us. We can't, for, we can't let go of things that trouble us. And we hold on to them for months and years and even decades. And things that happened in our childhood, we, some people can't let them go. So uh, how to overcome this? How do we get out of that kind of holding on to grudges? And sometimes those, that, that, that inability to let go has to do with things that we ourselves have done, that we have an inability to forgive ourselves for some mistake that we did. We keep remembering how we blew it at the, uh, at the you know, meeting with our boss or whatever. <laughs> so. Uh, it's hard to, sometimes it's very hard to forget. How do we forget? How can we forget, especially these painful things that happen, the, the traumas, the, 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 how do we forget? Uh, clearly, the, f the, first, uh, the first principle if, of forgetting these kind of things is forgiveness. Uh, and we'll talk more about that sh in, in a moment. Forgiveness, forgetting the, the heart, forgetting the injury. Uh, we also work in Vedanta on mastering our mind, on training our mind to think of something, to, uh, to replace a harmful thought with a positive one. This is a, a 
discipline of yoga, pratipaksha bhavana. It's an important, dis, important training of our mind, which we do in meditation, to, to withdraw the mind from one thing and place it on another. Repeatedly. Letting go, surrendering to the divine. To, to, p- placing uh, the whole matter in the hands of the divine. Fixing our mind on the divine. Placing our minds in the divine. Really, this is the final, the, the, the final answer to how do we forget. We place our minds in God, in the divine, in our divine mother. Try to think more and more of mother. And naturally, the, the infinite love that is the divine. And naturally, all the petty things begin to fall away as we place our minds in that infinite consciousness and joy and love. But this requires some maturity in spiritual life because at first, God is just an idea to us. And gradually, as we go on practicing, as we go on praying and meditating and studying and serving, we begin to grow in unselfishness, we begin to grow in faith, and we begin to taste also the peace that is the divine. We begin to get that intuition that, yes, there is a well of light and peace and joy deep within me. And as I begin to sink into that, as I begin to fill my mind with that, it becomes very easy. It becomes easier, shall we say, to let go of those uh, grudges and those resentments and those insults and all of that. Now, when I'm talking about the word forget, when we're using the word forget, I don't think I mean actually forgetting. It doesn't mean that I'll actually completely forget the next time I see my Uncle Sam or my Aunt Samantha that uh, she slapped me when I was five years old, but it won't come to my mind. The emotional charge is removed from it. I can still remember, oh yeah, she slapped me, okay, well. She, I, I was also being a little naughty, and she was, she was, you know, she has her limitations. She also got angry. Okay, it's, it's okay. So we remember it, but it doesn't disturb us. So it relinquishes the hooks that a memory has on us. It relinquishes the bondage that that memory puts us into. So I want to have a brief a digression into a certain kind of memory that is very difficult to overcome. These are traumatic memories. And uh, uh, there's a kind of, uh, there's a disorder, a mental disorder, as nowadays we all have heard of it, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. One experiences personally or witnesses a traumatic event or perhaps a series of traumatic events, perhaps a whole childhood of traumatic events, and uh, one cannot recover. The memories keep coming back as flashbacks. One experiences the anxiety, the, 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 the extremely upset emotions, and they take over our minds. Uh, and this can go on for months or years. Yes, when we experience a traumatic event, for everybody, there's a time, it takes time to process it and let it go. But for some people, uh, it's impossible to do alone. And for a long time, there was, there was really no treatment for it. Um, the symptoms may include nightmares, unwanted memories, avoidance of situations that bring back the memories, heightened reactions, anxiety, depression. It's really debilitating. Uh, I have a, a, ther- a friend who is a therapist uh, who, t- who uh, told me about w- what happens. A traumatic event is so big, so traumatic, that we can't process it in the moment. We, it's just too painful to process. It doesn't get integrated into our linear memory. And it, the event doesn't become like, well, it's an event that happened to me sometime in the past. It somehow gets locked in the right side of the brain, which is always in the here and now. And so when the memory is, is reawakened, it's like it's happening all over again. And uh, there is a remarkable treatment, many of you I'm sure have heard of it, and some of you have probably experienced it also, called EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitation and Reprocessing. Um, This facilitates processing a traumatic experience 
and to, so that it can be remembered tolerably, so that we can tolerate the memory of it. That emotional charge connected to the uh, traumatic experience is diminished and gradually dissipated. And the event or events get placed in time as memories. And the beliefs that we have about why it happened, how it happened, those kind of beliefs become mature. So what's the process? Um, first, the uh, person who is going to undergo this treatment uh, learns to develop a certain sense of safety, uh, learns to imagine a very safe place, and perhaps can imagine certain protecting beings who, who will protect the person. Uh, and then one reviews the traumatic experience in one's mind and f feels, the, uh, feels the emotions and then uh, undergoes some kind of physical action which involves both sides of the body and hence both hemispheres of the brain. And it was started with rapid eye movements, uh, not too rapid, but eye movements, which is why it's called EMDR, but now there are other things which are used, but the therapist would typically p place a, a hand or an object in front of the person and move it side to side, and the person just has to follow it with their eyes while that memory of the traumatic event is going on. That might go on for 30 seconds or a minute, and amazingly, and nowadays they use things like tapping on the opposite sides, or they have little buzzers that you can hold in your both hands, and they, they buzz alternately, so you're stimulating uh, the the right and left hemispheres of the brain alternately. And amazingly, this helps to integrate traumatic memories. So it's actually quite a neurological thing. It seems like there's a lot of neurology here. And I don't, I'm not a neurologist. I know very little about it. But this is a fascinating um, treatment which allows those traumatic memories to be integrated into linear time as they are brought also into the left hemisphere. Left, right. Um, <laughs> it seems so. I, I don't know. So um, it requires a, a trained professional. So that's a little digression into uh, the kinds of memories that are more than just painful memories, more than just we can't let go of a grudge, uh, uh, we can't forgive someone. It's a really a traumatic memory which brings up these intense emotions and all that. So that is, uh, I thought it, we should address that at least uh, briefly in this discussion today. So let's talk a little more about forgiveness. Uh, it can be very difficult, no doubt. Sometimes we feel like some, somebody did something that's just unforgivable. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a funny uh, country western song by Garth Brooks, uh, which, the, uh, which goes like this. We, I'm not going to sing it, though. <laughs> we bury the hatchet but leave the handle sticking out. We're always digging up things we should forget about. When it comes to forgetting, baby, there ain't no doubt. We bury the hatchet, but leave the handle sticking out. <laughs> Actually, very insightful. Uh, we, we try to forgive, and yet we keep the, you know, bury, you know the term bury the hatchet, to, forg to forgive uh, someone, you, you just bury the hatchet, but leave the handle sticking out so we could still go and take it out again if we need to. <laughs> really, if we bury the hatchet, we should forget where we buried it. Uh, so what is true forgiveness? I think part of it is that, that uh, it's not deigning to somehow tolerate a harm. All right, well, you did something terrible, but I'm going to tolerate you, and OK, I forgive you. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that happens with it, deep within us. And it's a, it's a deep recognition that the true I, who I truly am, cannot be harmed. I am spirit. I am pure love. Nothing can touch me in my true self. Yes, my, uh, my general self, the general self we all take ourselves to be can be hurt. But let us remember who we truly are as spirit. That cannot be touched by anything. Not, neither can weapons cut it nor fire burn it, as the Gita tells us, as Krishna tells us in the Gita. So it's a deep recognition that who I truly am cannot be harmed. And it's a, it's a letting go. 
And its purpose, primary purpose, is to free ourselves, for us to get free. Its primary purpose is not to, that, to uh, help the other person, though it may also help the other person overcome uh, feelings of guilt they may have for the transgression they did against us, as it were. Its primary purpose is to free ourselves. Interesting to note that the Sanskrit word for forgiveness, or one, of the, one of the Sanskrit words for forgiveness is kshama. Kshama, it's an attribute of the divine, and it means forgiveness, but it also means forbearance, and it also means patience. So in the Sanskrit, we have one word that refers to forgiveness, uh, forbearance, and patience. Something to think about. Balaram Bose, uh, Sri Ramakrishna's close disciple, called uh, the Holy Mother, Sri Sarada Devi, Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual consort, called her, uh, I'll give the Sanskrit term here, Kshama Rupa Tapaswini. This is a, a profound description of Holy Mother. She was the very embodiment of forgiveness, and, but Tapaswini, one whose whole life manifested forgiveness as an intense spiritual practice, as a, 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 her whole the discipline of her life was uh, manifested through this process, practice of forgiveness, of kshama. Her great tapas, this great spiritual practice, this great austerity, this great genera generating of spiritual power. How did it manifest itself? Through this kshama, this forgiveness and forbearance and patience all wrapped into one. So we have a question then, when, when do we forgive? Uh, when do we, do we forgive? How, 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 you know, there's that, that Peter in the uh, disciple of Jesus asked him, uh, Lord, how, how often uh, should I forgive someone? If my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive him? Maybe seven times? Because he thought seven, seven times is a lot of times to forgive someone. <laughs> so, and after that, well, then you get the... Uh, so, um, Jesus, what did Jesus say? Not seven. Seventy times seven. <laughs> In other words, 490. In other words, so many that it, would, it becomes... A, 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 Dr. Martin Luther King points out that this, what this means is one cannot forgive 490 times without becoming a part of the habit structure of one's being. Forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. This was what Jesus taught his disciples. That's Dr. King's beautiful insight. Uh, we can ask, what about injustice? There was recently a, 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 a big stir in the Los Angeles City Hall. There were horrible things, were, racist things were, came, were said, and it came to light. And, uh, Oh, people are, of course, naturally so angry and, it's, and feel like it's hard to forgive. And someone, one of the columnists wrote that, yes, for, uh, actually one of the council members said, yes, forgiveness, but first they should resign. Then we can forgive them. And we can think about forgiving them, but first they should resign. So there's, they, there may be some truth to that. Uh, but if we are called to work for justice, to, work, to call out injustice, to um, heal the injustices of the world. Can we recognize that forgiveness frees us, actually, from the bitterness, from the rancor, from the anger, which hamper our efforts? We feel like anger is a gives us tremendous energy to work against injustice. But actually, mostly when we're angry, we don't do the right thing. We can't see the right thing to do. We all make mistakes when we're angry. We all say things that we regret when we're angry. We all have sent emails that we wished we hadn't sent. We sent them when we were angry, right? And <laughs> so a couple of other strategies uh, for uh, understanding uh, the suffering that we get and how maybe we can let it go. 
Uh, one is to take the attitude of karma. And uh, one of our Swami, our Swami in Washington, D.C., Swami Atmagyananda, he says, we apply here a benevolent double standard. And I love this. Benevolent double standard when using karma to understand suffering. Because we, we apply it differently to ourselves and to others. We, when we are suffering, we can say, it's my karma. But when you are suffering, I can't say, it's your karma. That would be a very uh, nasty thing to say. When you're suffering, I have to say, I'm so sorry. Can I help you? Can I help alleviate your suffering? However, when it comes to understanding our own suffering, karma can be a way for us, if we have some faith in the, uh, the theory of karma, if we believe that uh, all actions have their effects and that perhaps we have lived in different times, in different bodies, and have also done our share of wicked acts, and those have their repercussions, and so I have suffering here. Well, it's my karma. It can be a way to accept it. This is Swami Vivekananda himself used this method. He, when, when Sturdy, uh, his disciple, uh, Stur uh, Mr. Sturdy in England, uh, get, left him and uh, felt that, and, and really uh, hurt him quite a bit, Swami Vivekananda let it go. He said, of course, it is my karma, and I am glad that it is so. For, though it smarts for the time, it is another great experience of life, which will be useful either in this or in the next. So uh, this is another way to um, process uh, when, we, when we suffer, when, when difficult things happen to us. There is a level to which we can attain where we don't even notice or realize that, that uh, we are, uh, that uh, there is any question of forgiveness. Take the example of Sri Ramakrishna and uh, the priest, Chandra Haldar. There was a priest who served uh, the um, Mathur Babu, the proprietor of the Kali temple at Dakshineshwar, where Sri Ramakrishna lived most of the time. But he also would stay at Mathur Babu's Calcutta home. And this priest was the priest who would service the shrine in Mathur Babu's home. And Mathur Babu had recognized something in Sri Ramakrishna. So he was ready to serve him and give him anything he wanted and had tremendous reverence for him. This uh, Haldar, he became very jealous. And he felt Sri Ramakrishna must ha know some charm, some mantra, which he has placed a spell on Mathur Babu. Actually, it was Sri Ramakrishna's purity, his divinity, his holiness, which attracted Mathur Babu. But Haldar didn't have the, the eyes to see that. So uh, he kept asking him, tell me what it is. Tell me how you could got control of him. Give me the mantra so I can also get control of him. And I can also get all the good things from him. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna tried to. Uh, remove this, as he put it himself, Haldar really believed me to be the possessor of some magic charm. I tried my best to remove this false idea from his mind, but I could not do it. So uh, one day, Sri Ramakrishna was lying in spiritual ecstasy on the floor, and Haldar came in wearing boots and kicked his body a number of times, leaving black, black, black bruises all over it. Uh, those who found out about it wanted to tell Mathur Babu about it, but Sri Ramakrishna forbade them. He knew that probably the, the guy would have been killed or at least severely beaten. Uh, and so he uh, forbade anyone from saying anything. And it seems he never, had, there was no rancor in him about it. It was just that he almost blamed himself for being unable to convince the man that he didn't have a magic charm. So there comes a state. And we can, we can see it a little bit, say, when raising children. Sometimes our children might say in anger, I hate you, mom, or I hate you, dad. And does it hurt? It might hurt a, it might hurt a little, but it might not also. If we're in a really loving state, we know that they don't, they're just upset. Our, our kids don't hate us. They, we love them so much, and they also love us. So there comes a state when we can love all beings like that. 
and then there's no question of even feeling insulted, even feeling hurt. So that takes it to a next level. Swami Vivekananda instructed his brother disciples, his uh, brother monks, and this, uh, this kind of instruction is also applicable in, in, of course, in our monastery, but also in family life and in com any kind of community of which we are a part. The success of your undertakings depends wholly on, upon your mutual love. There is no good in store so long as malice and jealousy and egotism will prevail. So we know this, uh, but we, it's good to make it conscious. Jealousy, egotism, malice. Know, and here he gives a hint, know that talking ill of others in private is a sin. Swami Vivekananda rarely used this term sin, very rarely. He would say, we, sin, that we, our true nature is perfect and immortal bliss. We are not sinners. It is a sin to call human beings sinners, he would say. And yet sometimes he used this language when he was really serious about uh, pointing out something that we should not do. And this is one of them, speaking ill of others in private. You must wholly avoid it. So, and then he points out, many things may occur to the mind, but it gradually makes a mountain of a molehill if you try to express them. Yeah, there's, there, the, it's actually from Bengali, til teketal means from a tiny uh, sesame seed, you're making a big mass of something. So it's the same, same idea, the... the uh, a little molehill and making a mountain of it. The more we think about it, the more we talk about it and complain about it. Oh, don't you know what he did? He did that. And before you know it, we've made a mountain of a little molehill. Everything is ended if you forgive and forget. Now, there's another aspect to forgiveness also, and that is forgiving ourselves. We've all done mistakes. We've all done things that we regret. Let it, let it go. Forget it. We, but learn from it. <laughs> learn from our mistakes and then let them go. All right, everyone makes mistakes. In fact, it's one of our monastic vows. I will entirely give up brooding over my past mistakes. How powerful. All right, we make mistakes. Let it go. Forget it. Forget about it. <laughs> Forget about it. Apologize. If we need to apologize, apologize. Learn. Don't do it again. Apologize. Then forget it. Forgive ourselves. Life is too short to go on punishing ourselves. Life is, there's too much punishment in this world already. And for us to go on punishing ourselves as well, it's uh, not necessary. So... Though it can be difficult, we have to let it go. We have to let it go. So things to remember, things to forget, and things to remember. Of course, we turn it, as I talked a little bit before about it, we really, the, 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 the final solution is pour our, pour, place our minds in the divine. Remember God. And Sri Krishna many times reminds Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, remember me. Remember me and fight. Yes, you have to do a fight. Yes, this whole life is a fight. We all have to fight. Remember me and fight. Remember God and fight. Uh, don't forget God. Uh, I am easily attainable, he says, by that ever steadfast yogi who remembers me constantly and daily with a single mind. Every day. Constantly, we continue to keep our minds in God. And gradually, all the unimportant things, they fade away. So there's a song that Sri Ramakrishna used to sing. Uh, he, he loved this song, Remembering Death. Now, it seems kind of morbid. Why should we remember death? Sri Ramakrishna really said we should re always remember death. Keep it in the forefront of our minds. Why? To be morbid? No to remember that this too shall pass and to prod us, to force us, to push us to think of God, to think of the divine, to think of our 
own immortal nature. And there's a beautiful song he used to sing. Remember this, O oh mind, nobody is your own. Vain is your wandering in this world, trapped in the subtle snare of Maya as you are. Do not forget the mother's name. So in a way, that's enough. Don't forget the mother's name. Hmm. Monarch can sing that song for us sometime. <laughs> I can try the first line. Bebe dek mun ke karunoi Miche brahm bhumandale Bholo na dakshina kali Badha hoye maya jale this idea, Bhulona Dakshina Kali, don't forget Mother Kali, don't forget our Divine Mother. And there's that also that song of about uh, Mother Durga, Sri Durga Nam Bhulona Bhulona Bhulona. Don't forget, don't forget the name of Mother Durga. Simply the Divine Name has so much power. Let us not forget it. Let us hold on to the, the Divine Name, whichever aspect of the Divine appeals to us, attracts us, whether it's Mother Durga or Jesus, or Allah, it doesn't matter. So, it's easier to let go of petty things when we remember that, yes, this too shall pass, my, even my body will come to an end, and uh, let me hold on to that which does not change, my true immortal self, one with God. So Sri Ramakrishna would also point out how, how difficult it is to live in the world, especially uh, how easy it is to forget God. And so he would caution us against that. He would say, it is not good to become involved in too many activities. That makes one forget God. Pride, occult powers. If we seek occult powers, that is sure to beget pride, he cautions us. And pride makes us forget God. We start thinking a lot about ourselves. We're thinking about ourselves instead of about God. Too much wealth, he says, too much wealth also makes us forget God. That is the very nature of wealth. Lust and greed alone makes up this world, this world of suffering, he means. It makes one forget God. So his own condition was the opposite. He would forget the world. He would forget his own body in thinking of the divine. And when he was suffering at the end of his life from throat cancer, a tragic uh, disease uh, where his body was wasted away, and he'd be there with this, uh, with this open sore on his throat and his disciples sitting around, and he would be completely unmindful of it, talking with his uh, disciples, and not only would he be forgetting about his disease, he would make his disciples forget about it too. He had that power. Those are beautiful. He used to give the example of Sita in Sri Lanka. Ravana had, had kidnapped Sita and kept her in Sri Lanka. And he sent, uh, Rama sent Hanuman to find her. And he found her. And so he, Rama asked her, how, how, is, uh, how is Sita? How did you find her? Hanuman said, O oh, Rama, I saw that only the body of Sita lay there. It held neither her mind nor her soul. She has indeed consecrated her mind and soul to your lotus feet. Therefore, I saw only her body in Ceylon, in Lanka. Further, I saw the king of death prowling about. But what could he do? It was only a body. It had neither mind nor soul. So this, <laughs> this idea, Sri Ramakrishna would utter this prayer, O oh mother, Make me like Sita, completely forgetful of everything, body and limbs, totally unconscious of hands, feet, and sense organs, only the one thought in her mind, where is Rama? So this is the kind of forgetfulness that uh, it's an art to cultivate this kind of forgetfulness through intense remembrance of God. He also used to liken three. He used to describe Sri Chaitanya as completely forgetful of the world. And usually, when he talked about Sri Chaitanya, he was describing his his own condition. He would say, uh, "This intense love called prema has two characteristics. First, it makes one forget the world. So intense is one's love of God that one becomes unconscious of outer things." 
And second, one has no feeling of minus towards the body, which is so dear to a person. One wholly gets rid of the feeling that the body is the soul, that who we are is this body, that uh, um, we talked about that autobiographical, auto, auto, that, that story that we tell about ourselves, the autobiographical memory. Uh, we start to disidentify with that through intense love of God. But it's not so, not so easy as all that <laughs> to get it. Um, it can be done consciously. We can take up this idea of consciously disidentifying with some of uh, the characteristics of our personality, some of our likes and dislikes. Uh, Swami Swahanandaji, the previous head of this center, of course, many of us knew and loved him very much, knew him well and loved him very much. Um, just after he had joined the monastery, he was sent from Calcutta to Madras, now Chennai, in South India. Uh, the two places are like two different countries, actually. India is, uh, the different states of India have different languages, different food habits, different cultures, all united by the Sanatana Dharma, the, the scriptures of India and the traditions of Hinduism are common to all of them, but even how those tra traditions manifest are different in the different states. So it's, it's more like, it's almost more like uh, Europe, as it were, but combined into one country, a unified Europe, maybe, but with all the different countries, the different states. So um, his mentor, Swami Premeshananda, wrote him this letter when he was sent to Madras. He writes, your new life has now begun. As a result of your great good fortune, you have gone to the land where Shankara and Ramanuja enacted their divine play. Both Shankara and Ramanuja, two of the great philosophers, saints of India, were from South India. Now forget about your caste, family, and tradition, and freely mix with our brothers from South India. Let not even a drop of identification as a Bengali remain. Swami Swahanji was from East Bengal, so he was, uh, spoke the Bengali language and English, of course, and uh, was steeped in the traditions of Bengal. This pride in our Bengali heritage is a terrible defect among Bengalis, an unbreakable bondage. Let me add that he could be speaking to any uh, uh, cultural group, <laughs> not just Bengalis. If, if he was speaking to Tamilians, he would probably say the same thing, or he's speaking to Italians or Hungarians or uh, Jews or, or um, Vaishnavas or whatever it is. He would, he would, uh, he would say this, this pride in heritage, our heritage. It is a great sin to consider oneself quote-unquote Bengali, even after taking sannyasa. So of course, uh, Swami Swahanji was not, he was still a novice, but uh, this idea that um, becoming a, ordained as a sannyasin, being a Swami, you have to give up that identification. And really for all of us, if we are spiritual seekers, we need to start breaking that identification with all those external things. Sri Ramakrishna said that really the, the only solution to the problem of caste is love of God. The lovers of God form their own community, their own. We, we identify ourselves not as from this particular family or from this particular culture, but as a seeker of the divine. And then all seekers of the divine become our intimate ones. And as we go on in that path, of course, all beings become our brothers and sisters. But those who are particularly seeking, those who are lovers, become our especially intimate ones. One, he goes on uh, scolding here. One may perform one's own shraddha ceremony. This is a reference to the ceremony in which one becomes a swami, where one performs one's own funeral rites, because one won't have any children to do it for one, oneself. So one performs one's own funeral rites. One may perform one's own funeral rites and still not get rid of his Bengaliness. <laughs> hmm. Give up your fish soup and become mad for rasam and other South Indian dishes. <laughs> Free yourself from this Bengaliness and be born as a man. Seeing your guileless nature, Thakur, that is Sri Ramakrishna, has become pleased. That is why he has freed you from the bondage of your own land and your own people. Probably he was feeling a little bit, possibly he was feeling a little bit... Uh, 
uh, what to say, like it's going to be a big challenge to go to South India. He used to joke often that Bengalis, they love sweets and they love to eat sweet things, but in, in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, sour is the main taste and, and people love the sour taste. So <laughs> it was probably a challenge for him to go there. So Premeshanji is saying, embrace it, embrace that sour rasam, that's the, that hot sour soup that the, the Tamilians make, it's delicious. Clears out your sinuses and it's, it's, it's lovely. Uh, but um, if you didn't grow up with, with it, it might be hard to have it every single day. So be mad for rasam. <laughs> mm. The rest of the bonds, he says, Sri Ramakrishna has freed you from the bondage of your own land and your own people by sending them from Bengal to Madras. And then he says, the rest of the bonds, you will have to cut yourself. So we are called to be universal people. We, as students of Vedanta, we are called to be universal people, to feel our kinship with everybody, to forget that we are Americans or Bengalis or uh, Armenians or Russians or anything like that and identify as human beings first and then we can go still further as children of God, as shining lights, as sparks of the divine, as one with the divine. And the, the, f the further we go in this identification, the more we forget all, those, all the, the story that we usually tell ourselves about who we are and the, the story we present to others about who we are. And then we genuinely can feel that other people are our own people. This is a Holy Mother's message, her last message, of course. Uh, make the whole world your own. No one is a stranger. No one is a stranger. Make the whole world your own. How do we do it? By forgetting these things. This was the same instructions Swami Vivekananda gave to his brother Swami Turiyananda. When he sent him to Shanti Ashrama in Northern California to teach Vedanta, he said, go and establish the ashrama in California. Hoist the flag of Vedanta there. From this moment, destroy even the memory of India. Above all, lead the life and mother will see to the rest. So this idea just to, to uh, don't identify with these limitations. Identify with mother, and mother will take care of everything. What does it look like, someone who has forgotten uh, their identity as a body and as a mind? Well, what, what, what does it look like? Miss Waldo, Miss Ellen Waldo, Swami Vivekananda's disciple, was serving him in New York and bringing him, uh, coming every day to uh, uh, 39th Street in Manhattan from Brooklyn, or was it the Bronx? Anyhow, she had a long trip on several trains and all that to cook for him every day, and she was her, his editor, and uh, he, she took down the whole book Raja Yoga in longhand, and um, she had, when she first started getting to know Swamiji more, she was a little bit on her guard because uh, she had met a lot of teachers and they all fell short somewhere or other. So she was on her guard lest Swamiji too should fall short and to have some major defect. So they were in one of the New York brownstones, one of those uh, monotonous buildings where they all look alike. And uh, in the parlor uh, was a large floor to ceiling mirror. And she was in the room and she saw that uh, Swamiji was uh, fascinated by this mirror. And he, would, he stood before it again and again, gazing at himself intently. In between, he would walk up and down the room, then he would stop again at the mirror and gaze at himself, lost in thought. Miss Waldo's eyes followed him anxiously. Now the bubble is going to burst, she thought. He is full of personal vanity. <laughs> Suddenly he turned to her and said, Ellen, it is the strangest thing. I cannot remember how I look. I look at and look at myself in the glass, but the moment I turn away, I completely forget what I look like. Not identified with his body. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> 
So this is the ideal Swami Vivekananda places before us, Vedanta places before us. He says, uh, by the means of, and he, he suggests through karma yoga, also through, through service of others, we can also attain to this. We are, by the constant effort to do good to others, we are trying to forget ourselves. This forgetfulness of self, small s, is the one great lesson we have to learn in life. Human beings think foolishly that they can make themselves happy and after years of struggle find out at last that true happiness consists in killing selfishness and that no one can make them happy except themselves. Every act of charity, every thought of sympathy, every action of help, every good deed is taking so much of self-importance away from our little selves. The highest ideal is eternal and entire self abnegation, where there is no I, it is all thou. So uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, we talked, in some we talked about memories and, and how precious they are to us, how we treasure them, how we define ourselves by them, and then also about the importance of forgetting, uh, how some memories are better forgotten and yet they are very difficult often to let go. We have to release the emotional charge connected to certain memories uh, in order to be able to release them. Uh, we talked a little about ordinary forgetfulness. We forget God immersed in our activities. And what's the remedy? Well, think of God and forget the petty things of life while not being forgetful. That's one thing about Sri Ramakrishna. He was constantly immersed in God, but when he was, his mind was also very keen, and he wouldn't forget anything. People, <laughs> they were spending some time in the garden, and when he came back to his room, he said, hey, where's my umbrella? Oh, we forgot it there. What? You, you forgot it? Go get it. I'm, 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 I can't remember anything when I'm in ecstasy, and yet I don't forget my umbrella. So <laughs> we can't use that as an excuse for forgetfulness. The spiritual greats, and we are all destined for spiritual greatness, forget their lives in the thought of God. So let us go beyond the story that we tell ourselves and others about who we are and stand on our true divine self, where there is no I, it is all thou. Thank you. And we're now lucky to get a song from uh, Surdas. sense of something missing or just be satisfied with what we got would some memory of loss weigh down on us and keep our spirits lowly bent as if something great was taken from us and may never be with us again feel forgotten are we expecting to be found 
We're crying out to the heavens Cause we feel stuck here on the ground And it's the sight, I believe Of all the fallen heroes On the fields of lost illusions And broken dreams That makes us hesitate and wait Before we fight the foes That are always around And lie in wait bit by bit and part by part it was there from the beginning whole and complete to be discovered in the heart and I will fight my Lord for the gift of love you gave us I will fight for the light against those who would take it away Friends and foe alike may yet forsake me But I'll gather strength from you along the way Yes, I will fight, my Lord, for the gift of love you gave us I will fight for the light against those who would take it away. Friends and foe alike may yet forsake me. Swami Sumanasananda has a class this coming Thursday on first Kali Puja 
in Belor Mutt at 7.30 p.m. So that might be a good primer for our Kali Puja to hear his, his talk on uh, the first worship in our monastery of Mother Kali. So I will now uh, close with a chant. After the talk, we will go to the greenhouse living room uh, for those who would like to discuss further or raise your objections. Um, are there refresh did, re did refreshments? For, there's refreshments also. Great. Thank you very much. Om Asatoma Sadagamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Mam Ritangamaya Om Shanti 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 From the unreal, lead us to the real. From darkness, lead us unto light. From death, lead us to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace.